So, hello everyone. Hi. I'm glad to see you here. So, today we'd like to tell you a story of superheroes and superpowers. You may be surprised, but we really think that machine learning is a kind of superpower in computer science world. And every superpower has some kind of origins. Yeah, like radioactive spiders, or you come from outer space. Yeah. In case of machine learning, it's math. So, my name is Łukasz Gebel. That's my friend Piotr Czajka. Hello again. And we are software engineers at TomTom. Tom. We are working in Łódź, literally here. And we are working in location and navigation services department when we build services like search, matrix routing, mm, maps. geofencing, and maps. So a lot of online APIs, yeah. basically. These are our Twitter, so you can follow us. We will put slides on our Twitter accounts later. But let's get back to machine learning. So first of all, we'd like to give you a big picture view of what is machine learning and then go through supervised and unsupervised machine learning, focusing on math underneath. And of course, in the end, we'll be happy to answer your questions. OK, so let's start from the very beginning. So according to Arthur Samuel, who was one of the founding fathers of AI, machine learning is a field of study in which you give your computer ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So sometimes it's quite hard to write a good algorithm. Like it's hard to write an algorithm that recognizes your friends on a photo. And here you can use machine learning. You want to have a program that will learn how to do it. And in the picture you can see that Arthur Samuel is playing checkers with the computer that was able to learn how to play checkers by playing with human players. The second definitions by our Lecturer. So when we were studying, um, we had this task to implement intelligent methods. But we didn't understand what is intelligent methods, so we asked our lecturer. And he said that he considers every method that needs some kind of training as an intelligent or machine learning method. And he used this intuition that animals and people are usually considered to be intelligent. And we also need some kind of training to master our tasks. But it's very easy to say, make your computer learn how to solve problems. Yeah, you cannot give it a book, right? Yeah, it doesn't work that way. So how to do it? Let's look at the supervised learning, though. OK, personally, I like to compare supervised learning to being taught by a teacher. So when you were at primary school, probably you were learning how to solve very complex problems, like how to add numbers or how to read. And your teachers very often gave you examples and correct answers for them. And you could use these examples to generalize and solve the problem and to learn. The same applies to supervised learning. So first of all, you need to choose a mathematical model, your student that will solve the task. Then you have to prepare data set containing of examples and correct answers and present these examples to your model. Then you have to check how your model answers to your examples and adjusts model parameters so it responds correctly. That's the idea behind supervised learning. And one of the biggest family of algorithm methods in machine learning world are neural networks. And they have really vast number of applications from computer, science, computer vision to data compression. And interesting fact is that they were inspired by our biological brain mechanisms. So have a quick look at the biological neuron. So electrical signals from different neurons goes through dendrites to our neuron cell. And in our neuron cell, these signals are summed up. And if the sum is bigger than give, given threshold, our neuron produces its own output, own signal, which goes through axon and it goes to different neurons. That's how our neurons affect each other in a very simplistic view. OK, this intuition was used to build artificial neuron model. And in artificial neuron, we've got inputs. And these are like parts of your examples. These are real numbers, for example, pixels of, of an image. And weights, which are also real numbers. And how does it work? So you simply need to take your inputs multiply each input by corresponding weight, sum it all up, 
and put this sum into your activation function. And your activation function will give you one real number, which is a single output of your neuron. Okay, activation function may look like this. It's called sigmoid. It's like the classic one. And we will use this in our uh, examples. And it simply maps your sum into the value from zero to one. It has some inter in interesting uh, features like it's continuous and nonlinear. And by nonlinear, I mean it's, its input is not proportional to its output. Okay, the problem with neural networks is that they are quite hard to understand at first glance when you are beginners in the machine learning world. So we'd like to explain how machine learning works under the hood with the use of linear regression, which is a simple method because it's, it's just a method that reflects relationships between variables. So for example, you can check how house size is versus its price. Okay, we also like to explain things using real life examples, but we think that superheroes have really cool, cool. lives. So we will yeah. use the lives of superheroes today. So let's imagine that there is a superhero, like wannabe superhero, and what comes to your mind when you think about superheroes? Do you have any ideas? You can yell it out. Anyone? Anyone? Sorry? Mask. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I like that's that. A, that's a great direction, yeah. to be honest. Piot, maybe so, something? I don't know. Long nose? Long nose, say? like Pinocchio. Yeah, yeah you know. Ah, but Pinocchio was liar, like a little liar rather than superhero. Yeah, but you know he could turn into a donkey, so come on. Yeah. So the mask was the right direction. So yeah. in my opinion, <laughs> costume is quite important. Because, you know, we shouldn't judge the book by its cover. But let's imagine that you're in trouble because, you know, things happen. You're in trouble. And now the guy to the right comes to rescue you. So pff, he's not very liable. And you're yeah. probably like, oh, God, I'm going to die. On, yeah. on the other hand, original four on the left is quite strong. He looks good. He's, he's like the guy who is helpful, who can help you to get out of the troubles. So probably mm -hmm. the superpower of the guy to the right is being super creative. Mm -hmm. But we want to be popular. So let's state our problem. So let's say that you are a wannabe superhero and you'd like to be popular, of course. So how much do you need to invest in your costume to be popular? Yeah. So to appear in a certain number of comic books. Yeah. Right. So we did a really serious scientific research and we have found the most published superheroes ever. So for every superhero, we've got the number of comic book issues in which they appeared. And then we checked how much you have to pay for its costume on eBay. So that's how our data look like. So we've got two numbers, costume price and the number of comic book issues. So one point is a one superhero. And we think that you can always learn something from your data. And this time we learned that you have to pay over $100 for Invisible Woman costume, which can be found somewhere there, I believe. Yeah. I'm not sure, but yeah. probably it's somewhere there. And there are two options. Yeah, either it's a brilliant scam and we all should sell such costumes because it's a good way of earning money. Yeah, or it's a really good costume because I can see anything there and all of us should buy it. But we'll leave the decision to you. Okay, in linear regression, our model that will solve our task is a simple line equation. So we've got two parameters theta 0 and theta 1. These parameters will be adjusted. And we've got our x, which is a costume price, and the f is a result of our function, so it's the number of comic book issues for a given costume price. Okay, so our data looks like this. And our task is to find the line that fits it in the most optimal way. It may be here or here or somewhere else. And now, how to do it in a machine learning favor. So, First of all, we'll need an objective function. So objective function is the function that tells you if your model's model is good or bad. In our case, it looks like this. And there is a sum. And for every point, you need to calculate such formula. So you have to calculate your function f for current data parameters, subtract the expected values of the number of comic book issues, and square all of it. But let's look at the simple example. So let's say that for one superhero, our function returns four. 
but we were expecting two. So in our formula, we've got four minus two, it's two, two squared, it's four. We need to add four to our sum. For different point in our data set, our function may give us one, and we may expect it one. So we've got one minus one, it's zero, zero squared, it's still zero. You don't need to add anything. So you see that if input matches the output, the expected output, the value is zero or it will be very close to zero. So the less, the better. It means that we need to minimize our objective function to find the optimal parameters of data. And to do this, we will use gradient descent algorithm. And gradient descent algorithm is like a superhero of machine learning world. So you will find this idea in neural networks, in deep yeah. learning, and ma yeah. many more complex ideas. Okay. And it's quite simple iterative algorithm, and it works like this. So in every iteration, we just need to update our two data parameters, in our case, these data parameters, using these complicated formulas. How these formulas work? So basically, you need to subtract alpha, which is a small real number, multiplied by a derivative of objective function. These formulas are derivatives of our objective function. And you're probably thinking how, how to calculate such, such derivatives and why we should use it. It's quite complicated, yeah? But the idea behind derivatives is quite easy because derivative, the, the basic idea behind derivative is that it gives you the information how your function is changing. So if your function is increasing, the derivative will be positive. If it's decreasing, it will be negative. If your function is stable, it will be zero. So let's look at the simple example. Let's say that we've got only one theta, and our function, objective function looks like this, simple parabola. And let's say that we calculate our derivative, our gradient descent at this point. At this point, the parabola, the function, is increasing. So the derivative will be positive. In our formula, we've got minus alpha times positive derivative. Minus times positive gives us negative value. It means we need to subtract a value from our theta parameter. Subtracting means we are going to the left. At this point, function is still increasing, so we do the same. It's still we need to still subtract this value. And again, and again, until we reach the minimum. On the other hand, at this point, our function is decreasing. So the derivative will be negative. So we've got minus alpha times negative value. Negative times negative gives us positive value. It means that we need to add something to our theta. Adding means going to the right. So we add, here is the same situation, so we add again and again until we reach the minimum. So it's like walking down the hill on, on your function until you reach the minimum. That's the main idea behind gradient descent, and that idea is present in, in many, many machine learning <laughs> methods. Okay, so now I will use this idea to solve our problem. I will use Octave. Yeah, what did you say? free version of MATLAB, it's open source, so you can all download it and try it yourself. Yeah. yeah, so our objective function looks like this. So syntax is quite concise. So that's simply our f function, because we've got theta times x, and we subtract our number of comic book issues, we do the square all of it, and of course sum. And the gradient descent algorithm is a simple for loop when we update datas. And it's a vectorized form, so under this data variable, we've got two numbers, two datas. And this formula is the alpha, and that's the formula for the derivative. Okay. And I simply load my data, these data points that you've seen before. I extract x, I extract number of comic book issues, I initialize data at this value, alpha will look like this, and I will run my gradient descent for 1,000 iterations. And I should get optimal data. So let's run the code. And this is our optimal data. But it's not very helpful, so let's plot result. Okay, and here is the result. That's our optimal function. 
and now our wannabe superhero can use it. So let's say that I would like to invest $1,000 in my costume. So it's here, $1,000, I can take my function, my prediction, and it appears that according to my prediction, I should appear in about 8,000 comic book issues, which is not a oh, bad cool. result. Yeah. yeah, pretty cool. Solving this problem, we also learned something set about human nature, because yeah. you can see that the more you pay, the more popular you are. And probably that's why Batman's superpower is being rich. Okay, get back to the presentation. Okay, here we are. The problem with linear regression is that it's linear. Yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. You're welcome. And let's say that you'd like to separate Marvel superheroes from DC superheroes, superheroes from different universes. In ideal world, you could use linear methods and go like this. But in real world, data is much more complex, everything is mixed, and we need nonlinear methods. And how, that's how it looks like. So that's the part when our neural networks come to the rescue. So simple shallow neural network, looks like this. We've got input layer, the, the yellow one, neurons. They just pass your input to the hidden layer, the blue neurons. And in the hidden layer, our neurons have this sigmoid activation function. And the output of hidden layer is the input to the output layer, the red one. And the red one also has sigmoid function. And it's the final output of our neural network. The green one with plus one, they are called biases and they give our neural network some kind of flexibility while going through our data. And how to, how to train our neural network, how to make it learn? First of all, you need to randomly initialize every weight of every neuron, that's the first step. Then, you need to present your examples. So you take the first example, input goes to the first neuron, you multiply inputs by weights, calculate activation function, then you do the same for the second neuron, the third one, calculate the output of the sigmoid, and this output goes as an input, and you also multiply each input to the hidden uh, output layer by the weights, and you've got the output of your neural network. Then you can use gradient descent algorithm that I showed you before with the computed error, because now you've got the output, you know what to expect, so you can compute the error, and you need to combine gradient descent and this computed error. And how to do it? You simply need to push this error backward through your network, and while doing this, use the same gradient descent algorithm to update every weight of every neuron in your neural network. Okay, so we've got our error, and now we are pushing it back do the same multiplication, activation function, and updating, updating our, our weights of neurons. Of course, the formula of the gradient descent will be a little bit different, because now you will need the deriv derivative of the sigmoid function, but the idea about walking down the hill and finding the, the minimum stays the same. Okay, when we finally understood how neural network work, and we were very proud of it. Yeah, we thought it's you know, the pinnacle of evolution of computer science. So basically a golden hammer, and everything was a nail back then. Yeah, but then our teacher came, and she said that, come on guys, this is just randomized optimization. Yeah. And that's true. It's not magic behind machine learning. There is no magic. It's more or less complicated math, but still it's math. It's something that everyone can understand, everyone can use. And it's nothing special, really. Still, we think it's quite good and really powerful, powerful methods. They will help you to solve problems, mm -hmm. but we think it's good to be aware that it's optimization, mm -hmm. so when you are working with your methods and you keep it in mind, it will be easier for you to solve your problems. So, I've got costume, now I need to have a logo, because every superhero has a logo. And superhero logos are usually nonlinear, like this Iron Man logo. So I will generate my own with the use of this simple neural network. So I will get to Octave once more and to my neural network code. And I will use a grid of points as my input. So 
I've got this plot grid. So these are my, my, this is my data, simple 2D points. And I will show you how it looks like. So every point has X and Y coordinates, and the expected output will be 1 or 0, so the label. And then I will, when, when my neural network learn, I will plot our points with different colors. So ones will have different colors than zeros. Okay, and that's my code. So I simply load my data, extract examples, so X and Ys, and coordinates, and the labels, one or zeros. Then I will run my training for 1,000 iterations. I will use 200 neurons in my hidden layer, and the output layer will have only one neuron, one or zero and then I run my training. Then I will take the same input, the same data that I showed my neural network during the training, and this already trained neural network will generate the labels, and I will plot it, and we will see the results. Okay, so let's generate logo. And now all of this gradient descent stuff is happening, that's yeah. why it takes some time, and we are ready. So now I can plot results, so plot data, input, mm. and predicted values. And here we go. Mm. It turns out that our neural network learned how to distinguish points that are inside Batman equation from the points that are outside of it. Why? Because that's how I prepared the data. So I simply labeled point, labeled point that are inside of it different than points that are outside of it. And Batman equation is, of course, nonlinear. Yeah. But there are two problems. Yeah, Batman logo is already taken, so uh, that's not the best idea to take it. Yeah, and the second problem is that my neural network produces label for the data that it already seen during the training. So it's like answering questions that you already know answers to. So now I need to use more data that wasn't present during the training, and I will check how my neural network will perform. So now I will use thicker grid. There will be around 25,000 points, and these points don't have label. They are just X and Ys, and my neural network that I trained will produce the labels. So here we've got our generate true superhero code, I load the data, the thicker grid. I extract inputs, so X and Y coordinates for every example. And then we've got these predicted values, so my neural network will predict labels for this point. And I will plot it again. So let's generate true superhero logo. And here we go. And I will plot it now. You see it's much more thick. And, yeah. whoa, you yeah. can see what happened. It looks really nice. So it's like flying squirrel man yeah. logo. Maybe, maybe elephant man with a short trunk and pointy <laughs> ears. Yeah. Uh, somehow. <laughs> so you can see it's, it's not perfect anymore, yeah? It's, it's not perfect solution. It's not perfect, perfect Batman. But it still resembles our, our Batman. It's still similar. Of course, there are some errors. Here, it, it should be more rounded, and here, we don't have ears, and so on. And that's what happens in machine learning very often. So you won't get perfect solution because probably you can't get the perfect solution. You wouldn't use machine learning if you know how to get the perfect solution. You will get the good enough solution. Yeah. yeah. Probably we could do some tweaks and tricks, so we could add more data to the wings, choose better parameters of our neural network to make it more similar to Batman logo, but we'd like to show you how it works in general. Okay, so I think I proved that neural networks can solve nonlinear problems, and now yeah. Piotr will tell you what happens when there is no teacher in a classroom. Yes, so now we will let them learn by themselves, and although it might be a bit surprising, we're still not quite near the Skynet because, well, Skynet is an AI and we're doing machine learning, so it's still kind of different stuff. But, okay, so we have a perfectly working uh, supervised learning. Why would we even care to let them learn by themselves? 
First of all, we're lazy. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we don't want to use derivatives. We don't want to push that arrow backwards. We just want to use some adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and that's all. And, well, unsupervised learning uses a very simple mathematical apparatus. Of course, you can make it more complex if you like, but you can just stay with those easiest math that you started in preschool. And, well, it does something a bit different because although it is called unsupervised learning, we still need to know what is at least the direction we want to go, but it helps us to cluster stuff. So clustering means that uh, we don't know what the labels are, we just want to find out uh, which things are similar to one another. So, you know, like we are children, we are going out to see the world, and we are trying to find heads and tails out of it. So, we saw, oh, it's a flower, it looks a bit like a tree, so they're probably similar. But then we saw a mushroom and we thought, oh, it's, it's also similar because it's, it grows out of the ground. And these are the errors of unsupervised learning. And I think the general idea behind unsupervised learning is best described by a totally um, unrelated study uh, in which children from all around the world were asked a simple question, which I think all preschool children are asked. So, which doesn't belong in the picture? And, of course, children from Latin culture said, of course, grass doesn't fit because, you know, cow and chicken, they're animals. Uh, but on the other hand, there was a group of children, mostly from the Asian cultures, who said, chicken doesn't fit because, you know, cow eats grass and chicken doesn't eat grass, it doesn't eat the cow and it doesn't work the other way around. So, obviously, chicken doesn't fit. And if you hear those two explanations, they are both viable and you can apply them. So that's why it's very important that you need to know beforehand what is the direction you're aiming, because then you can be a bit surprised. And if you know what you want to achieve, then you need to use supervised learning. So, uh, as I said, we'll be using unsupervised learning to group stuff. So when we want to use it, first of all, when the data is very uniform and we don't really know what should be the key or keys, or on the other hand, data is super complex and everything, every parameter in the vector, it could be a key. So, the first person who thought about that kind of learning was Professor Donald O'Hab. So, he wasn't a mm, mm, programmer, he wasn't a mathematician, he was a biologist. And of course, he was you know, super interested when first uh, artificial neurons were created because he was working with real brains and now we're trying to achieve something that is an artificial brain, so that's super cool. So he tried to apply the same logic that he knew from bio biology to mathematics. So he thought that if a natural brain cell learns in such a manner that when a signal comes to the brain cell and it responds, the next time the similar signal comes, it responds with a slightly bigger force. So, that's how simple Hebbian learning algorithm was born. And as you can see, uh, the change of a single weight is proportional to the signal that came to that weight and the output of the whole neuron. So, and the proportion, of course, it's the learning coefficient that you've seen previously when Wukas was presenting. And you probably noticed that it can rise quite quickly to the high values. So, Professor proposed something a bit different. He said that you should find a function uh, that just fits your needs and it would be this function that you can use to change your weight. So, it's a function between input and output. And we call it the generalized Hebbian learning algorithm. But today, we'll be focusing on that one, first of all, because it's simple and we're striving for simplicity today. And second of all, because, you know, you can see where it runs short. If we have it all fixed, you won't see the issues that can come out of Hebbian learning. So, just a quick recap. Uh, this is the neuron. You saw it previously. The only change is this little part down here that updates the weights. And it looks like this. When a signal comes, it's multiplied by corresponding weights, and those partial sums are created, that they are then summed up, and pushed through the activation function. Then we take this value from the activation function, and the initial signal, we put it uh, to the simple Hebbian learning algorithm, we calculate the changes in weights, and for the next example, we have this new neuron, well, 
the old neuron, but with the new weights. Okay, so the demo part. What we would like to show you is how you can divide stuff. And to do that, we'll come back to our superheroes. And, you know, we have a costume, we have a logo, so now we need to join a superhero team. So we heard that Avengers, they have a vacancy, so maybe we could join somehow. And, you know, these guys, these four guys, the, the core of Avengers. So we have Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, and Thor. And, you know, we think that those guys could fit better into other teams, because Captain America, he's the guy who is the natural born leader. But on the other hand, you know, Thor is the son of Odin. He's also even more naturally born because he's son of the king. And then we have Iron Man who smites his opponents with repulsive rays, but Thor smites his enemies with lightning, so it's a bit similar. And we saw him fighting Hulk, and they were both the equal match. So maybe, just maybe, we can uh, take more, even more superheroes, divide them into four groups, and then take one superhero from each group of similar superheroes, and create a kind of optimum superhero squad. Yeah, super duper squad. Yeah, we can call it that. And we used the values taken from Marvel database, in which every superhero is described by six attributes, and thanks to that, we could create a vector that uniquely describes every of those superheroes, and maybe we can divide them into similar groups. So we'll be sticking to the four groups, and we'll come back to the octave now. I will just quickly come back to my part. I will show you those superheroes yet again. And as you can see, these are the vectors, and I'm dividing them by seven. Uh, that's called normalization, because those uh, neural networks work best when they deal with values between 0 and 1, or minus 1 and plus 1. So, what we, because we know that minimum value is 1 and maximum is 7, so we can easily take 7 and divide everything by it, so we have values that fit, fit perfectly for our, for our neural network. Um, so, Hebbian learning, right? Uh, this is the example. We add bias that you've seen previously. Uh, then we calculate these partial sums. In fact, this is the full sum because we're using vectors, and this, this vector multiplication also sums these values for us. Then we put it into sigmoid function. We have the sigmoid output, and now we can check which neuron responded with the biggest force. And for our leisure, uh, we create a kind of winner vector. So the winning uh, neuron has one, and all the others have zero. And so that when we'll be displaying those superheroes, we'll have columns. Each column will be one neuron, and every one in that column will, will indicate that this superhero belongs to that group. Uh, so in the end, we're just updating weights. Quite simple. Uh, We'll be showing all those superheroes 100 times. So these are called epochs. So every epoch is showing all the example set to our neurons. So we'll be showing this whole set 100 times with a very little learning coefficient because, as I said, uh, it will grow quite quickly. So we want to counter this somehow. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, but I think that it won't help because, as you can see, we have two groups, and, well, I was, quite frankly, I was really expecting that, and you will see that every time I run that stuff, it doesn't really give us great answers. Now we have three, but... Yeah, if so you're... every neuron is one column, yeah? Yes, as I said previously, yes. The, every neuron is one column, and you can see if I run it again, we have two, now we have again three, so, okay, I can stick with those three, because, well, it doesn't really matter, so it's not stable, we cannot get... Uh, if, if it would give us three columns every time, it would be great, but it doesn't. It gives us one, two, three. Uh, it's hard to work with such stuff. So it's a bit unstable, and it is, it's unstable because using this simple Hebbian learning algorithm, those weights grow so fast that there is a time when one or two neurons, uh, they have such high weights that even if a small value comes, uh, they respond with such a high force that the others, they just can't fit. So what do we want to do with that? We would like to you know, give them more freedom, obviously. So we will let them self-organize, hopefully not in unions. 
and there are those methods that are called learning with concurrency, a subgroup group of, of those previous methods uh, that strip away everything that is not needed in our neurons. So we're just sticking with the vector of weights. And what we're trying to achieve is that we're trying to make that vector a kind of everyman, a point in a, grou in, in a group that has the shortest distance to all uh, the other elements in that group. So we can do it using two strategies. So first one is winner takes all, the second winner takes most, and you know, they're probably self-explanatory, but for the sake of, of this presentation, uh, if we're using winner takes all, we're creating a kind of ranking. So we're checking which uh, neuron is the closest one to the example, and then we're letting that one neuron learn. On the other hand, in the winner takes most, we create a kind of ranking, so the further you are from the example, the less you learn, but you still have that ability. So you have the ability to move around and maybe find your own niche. So it, the idea looks similar to that. So if you have a neuron and we have an example, we calculate those partial distances, and in the end, we also calculate the full distance. So we're using Euclidean distance, the simple one, and it's the square root of five in this case. So if we imagine that the square root of five is the shortest distance uh, from all the neurons, then we proceed to creating a learning step, which is just taking those partial uh, distances and multiplying them by a learning coefficient. And having this learning step, we're subtracting it from the weights of the neuron. So in the end, after, uh, after this algorithm, we'll have neuron with new weights. And it's ready to take, take on new examples and, well, take his place in the new race. So to give you just uh, the visual aid, uh, if we have superhero logos that are on the solution space that really uh, takes care of the color, so they're grouped by color, and we're trying to get those neurons find their groups, they will be moving around on this solution space for some time until they find a kind of homeostasis. So that means that they don't move so much, so they don't stay in one place, because the more we let them learn, the more they will move slightly, but this is the place where this error is not so big. And, well, that this is how it would visually look. So let's come back to the demo, because I think that's a, a bit more entertaining nevertheless. Uh, so. Winner takes all algorithm. So you can see now that it's vastly different than Hebbian learning. Uh, we're not adding any bias now, and instead of sigmoid function, we're calculating the distance. Uh, and of course, this time it's Euclidean distance. Uh, we're also creating this winner vector, but this time it's more crucial because it's not only for showing us which neuron responded to each group, but also to tell us which neuron should learn and we're applying that in the end of our teaching method, so it's somewhere over there. And I will just jump to the winner takes most instantly, because I want you to see that there is only a slight change. So this is that part, because apart from searching for the best one, uh, we also need to create a kind of neighborhood. Uh, so we're using simple exponential function that takes into consideration the distance between the example and given neuron and the epoch number. So the idea behind it is that uh, the more times we show those examples, uh, the closer this neighborhood becomes, the narrower it becomes, so that at the beginning our neurons are more adventurous. They walk around, they, they're looking for their niche, and if they find one, we don't want to drag them out of there. So we just change those weights slightly, or none at all. So uh, as for the algorithm, we'll be showing it once again for 100 times with a slightly higher learning rate. And the same goes for winner takes most. It's just accompanied by number of epochs. Okay, so I will just run where it takes all for you, and you can see, again, we have three groups, but this is something that appears more frequently, right? I'm running it for the fourth time, and we still have three groups, better or worse, three groups, four groups. Well, it's kind of nice, I would say. Uh, okay, so we see that 
it's much less prone to those uh, instantaneous changes from one to three. We have three groups, so it's not the best still. Uh, I will try to run winner takes most. And you can see we got four groups. Again, four groups. Okay, one, one group is really small, but still we have four groups. So it's slightly better. So I will stick with that one. So of course, uh, yeah, I see four groups. I could have programmed that previously. So how to show you that it really is not uh, a fraud from us. Uh, I will try to add our superhero to the roster. And you know what they say, always be yourself unless you can be Batman. So I will use Batman just to stay there for us. Uh, the no winner takes all algorithm. And we'll see if all those methods create similar output. OK, so it's the first group, second group, and the fourth group. OK, I will just scroll up and see what is the first group in Hebian Learning. And it's Iron Man, Black Panther, Mighty Thor, Doctor Strange, Mr. Fantastic, Human Torch, Invisible Woman. Well, quite a nice group, to be honest. Is the second group for winner takes all. Okay, so that's the last one, it's the second. We have Black Panther again. We have again Doctor Strange, Mr. Fantastic, Human Torch, and the Invisible Woman. So, okay, so we have two different ways of learning and they cover quite nicely. And winner takes most is the last group. It's Iron Man. We have Black Panther that was also in the Hebian learning. Doctor Strange, which was in the previous two. Well, and that's all. But you see that those two guys, so Doctor Strange is the winner because he was in all the groups. Black Panther is also fitting there somehow. You can see that although we didn't care for the parameters, really, re we really wanted to make it you know, look bad. Uh, it didn't fail so much. They, it found some of the crucial similarities. But, you know, although those new methods, so winner takes all and winner takes most, they create us more diverse groups, they search better spectrum of answers, they have still some issues. So mostly if we don't care, that's, that's our fault. If we don't care and we create a, um, su such an environment that we have all the examples in one place and all the neurons in the other, it might happen so that only one neuron will learn and the others will just starve. So what we want to do is we want to spread those neurons and answers um, quite, quite evenly. And in the winner takes most, although it will be fixed because we will drag those neurons a bit, uh, in the end it will take a lot of epochs. So we should remember about that. So coming to the finish, because this guy is from Finland. So this is Professor Tuevo Kohonen, who created a self-organizing map. And this is something I want you to, t as a takeaway, to give you as a takeaway. He, although it sounds completely different from what we see previously, it's in fact winner takes most with a little twist. And this twist is that we have a fixed neighborhood. So no creating ranking every time. We're creating it once at the beginning, and then, you know, what we're trying to achieve, although it looks horrible, horrible as an equation, we can see it like something like this. What we're trying to achieve is we want to drag our neural network onto the solution space and cover it tightly, you know, like with a blanket during the cold winter. So in the end, what we want to achieve is that every neuron uh, will have its own niche. And of course, it's randomized optimization, so some neurons still might, might fall out, but it's the closest thing to certainty that we have in self-organizing uh, neural networks. And to wrap these neural networks for you up, so yes, we depend on randomized weights, and yes, we can stick to the local optimum, but you know, we have math, we can create stuff, we can calculate stuff that is perfect, but in reality, we don't live in a perfect world, and most of the time it will be very hard or even uh, we'll be unable to create stuff that is perfect. But if we take, create functions that evaluate our models, that take into consideration all that we need, so maybe cost, maybe time, uh, we will have something that is just that. So sometimes good enough is what you really need. Uh, this is basically the end. Uh, you have our Mm, 
uh, Twitter handles here. We will be giving this uh, presentation slides uh, on our Twitter. There is also up here the, the link to our codes, to the derivatives, and to this presentation in one package. Uh, there are some nice courses on Coursera. So the first one is free. It's machine learning uh, also using Octave. Uh, the second one is paid, but you can see all the videos for so free. For free. Yeah. So you don't have to pay for that. There are some very nice books and, of course, sources we used during these presentations. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And if yeah. you have any questions, please. <laughs> Yeah, so if you have any questions, please leave it out. You can also talk to us after the presentation will be around. And please evaluate our function, because we really appreciate your feedback. Aha, you said function. <laughs> our, our presentation, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.